Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Yusuf. I'm going to be doing my lecture that has more questions than answers, so just you know from the beginning. We always like to say the truth that nobody has everything figured out yet all the way. So we will start and I will share with you some of the slides, some of the things we can get to conclusions through, and some of the mysteries, especially in the ancient history. Please answer. This is from the city of uh, Habu, here in the, was in the West Bank in Luxor. Yeah. I chose that slide yeah. to show you the amount of writings, of course, on the surface. It attracted most of the academics. They wanted to translate everything so they can understand who built that and for what reason, what kind of uh, historical events did it uh, represent and other stuff. So basically, Writings, if we can look at Egyptology as a complex or as a temple, then the mother rock of Egyptology is writings. We depend on Egyptology and writings to date and relate and um, also identify sometimes what is the function of the obelisk, for example, or this is a pick from the Serapium. This is one of the megalithic boxes in there made from, we can call it black granite, or as Susan Moore, our geological teacher, taught us, porphyritic diorite, or cyanite with porphyritic diorite, since there are more than 700 types of granite stone. And this is the kind of writing you find on that box. As you can see, very crude. This is not just because the screen is wavy. This is actually how the lines look like. Hardly scratches on the surface. While the surface of the box itself is reflecting very advanced machining or very high quality finishing for the surface made from a stone that is seven on the most scale, very solid. The writing is reflecting that it is what we can label as hieroglyphic graffiti. Yet, we depended on these to date the box related to the era or to the person that we will find his name written on it, also understanding the function of it, which is, of course, that it was sarcophagus for the apis bones. Here you can find one example over here that shows that the chisel was not sharp enough that it slid when they were doing that line. You can also see that, of course, when we're going to go and see and look at the angles and the surface, we wouldn't, of course, accept that this would be the writings. So we have seen some good writings. We, I especially brought that example to compare between some of the best <laughs> machining and results of machining and some of the worst writings that was ever added to it. So for me it's clear and obvious that that box is much older than that writing and that box was being reused for another purpose. There are evidence in the Serapium that shows that the site was renovated and it was renovated with stones from other structures outside so we can find some of the part sites. We will talk, of course, more about it when we go to the Sarat. Sa'uzir. Heb Sa'uzir is where the word Serapis came from. Uzir, Heb. The, of course, the Greek uh, pronunciation and uh, um, influence on the understanding, on the pronunciation also of the word. So the word Heb, which meant fertility was pronounced by the Greeks Apis. That's where the Apis bull word came from. Osir, of course, Osir. So both of them became Osir Hep, became Osir Apis. That's where the symbol of Serapis, of course, that they think it was Greek, of course, <coughs> as ancient Egyptian. Also, the underground tunnel is a challenge because it's very long. The Serapium contained more than 20 chambers with boxes. Some of the chambers are empty without boxes, but most of them have. 
only three of them has writings and the rest is plain without writings. The challenge in the Sarapium really, we have seen other huge pieces of stones and we know that dynastic Egyptians were the one who moved them around. The challenge in the Sarapium that all the tunnels is carved in the bedrock and when we go there, you will see that just 60 of us will be struggling to move in one corridor. So imagine what kind of force they use to move these megalithic boxes underground. And there is also maneuvering for corners and the chambers themselves, they are on a lower level. So if we wanted to take the easy way, we would easily open that channel to the air and then bring as much people as we can in the outside, lay the box down, and then build the ceiling. But the fact that the whole tunnel is carved from the bedrock is a challenge that no one of, none of us want to take. There is no space for it. Look, let's go to the next one. This is also one from rose granite. You can see the ceiling is the, is the same like the bedrock, and the chamber itself is in a lower level. The width of that box is nothing more than two feet less than the width of the corridor itself, which makes it so challenging, especially if you need to turn. Mm -hmm. Like there's a tunnel going like that, and then a turn like that, and a turn like that, and then to the room. In that little space, go to the next slide. You can see just a few of us are filling the corridor. So we're, we are talking about 70 tons for the box and 30 tons for the lid. If we're gonna use 10 strong men for each ton, so you do the mess for 70 tons, you need 700 men. And the space is not gonna be enough for 700 men. Anyway, we're gonna get, see it when we do. Renovation, of course, happened in the side. This is one of the other unfinished boxes that shows the challenge. It's not just that they dragged these or they moved these megalithic boxes in the underground. They also manufactured them underground. If you turn off these lights there, and we will try to have that experience when we go so we can understand the challenge, you're not gonna be seeing anything. So imagine they are trying to convince us that this was done with torches. Imagine hacking in a soft bedrock like that with all the dust and the flames eating away the oxygen, it's a good way to suicide, of course. Here is one without writings at all, and we can see the sharp angles and the polishing as well. The polishing that we made a, a discovery, actually, to understand that there was a liquid. This is the base or the bottom of that lid. <coughs> And this is the side of it. And that liquid leaked down and formed these drops. And that was one way to understand that the polishing happened with an alchemy formula or an alchemy liquid that was used after smoothing the surface to give it that shiny finishing, which is not, of course, mentioned in any of the mainstream books. All what we depended on to understand how the polishing was done, we depended on some of the scenes that was on the walls showing, and I think I showed some of you that in the Egyptian museum, that uh, they believed that the polishing was done with sand and water and a piece of rock. And obviously here, that's not it. This is, whose name is that here? It's Ali's grandfather, where's Ali? <laughs> Ramses II. You can see, and we have seen some of examples like that, that the writings on the wall is a, is a relief while the name of Ramses II is carved deeply, which proves that it was added to the writings they have sold. During the dynastic Egyptian times, writings were being added above each other. Here is another statue in the Egyptian museum, and it has the name Ramses II as well and it was brought from Tanis. Many of the beautiful pieces in the Egyptian museum were taken from Tanis. And here is the label, seated the statue of King, probably, and this is according to iconography, 12 or 13th dynasty, usurped by Ramses II. 
1904, that's the, that's the age of the tag. So the tag became antique. <laughs> this is the missing piece that we, that's already taken to the new museum, to the Grandi Museum. And the name on the belt here is Jesser Khabar Ra Seti Ben Ra. And that's Hur Muhib, the successor or the king that ruled after Tut An Khamun. But we actually found that the iconography is for Tut An Khamun himself. So this is a colossal piece for Tut An Khamun. And they found, finally found out that it belongs to him. And when they move it to the Grand Museum, it's going to be labeled as Tut An Khamun, not as Hur Muhib. It's so clear. Let me go further. Here is the name on the belt, and we can see that this part was lower than it's. You can see the different result in carving. This is what reads Jesser Khabar Ra Seti Ben Ra, and that's the name of Hur Muhib that was added later. Also, two other statues. Go ahead. These, part, these ones are were displayed in the Egyptian Museum for Tut An Khamun, and they have the same thing. But the other one was not, until that time, it was not still related to Tut An Khamun, but it was related to Horeb Hib. You see, the same case here happened in these statues. And the ones we saw in Luxor Temple, where we saw the name is coming above the dagger, when we were Exploring around Karnak yesterday, some of the megalithic statues showed perfection in the details and in the three-dimensional figure perfection. So that's why from a point of view of a stone carver like myself, I wouldn't accept that this can be a mistake happening by the original carvers of the statue. Because if you can figure out the three-dimensional uh, details that sharp, there is no chance that you're going to fail doing one in a two-dimensional writings like that. You see the, the line coming above the dagger? That's the dagger, and there is the line of the name coming on top of it. This one we have seen in the Egyptian Museum, and it says the same case. Also that this colossal statue was usurped by Merim Pitah from his father, Ramses II. But how can we know that Ramses II also didn't deserve it from a previous king? There is another statue that has the writings of Merim Pitah, the successor and the son of Ramses II. And I brought the, these pictures here to that to show exactly where the usurpers can add the writings in certain points that would look that it was originally part of that carving. The other way, another one. Front of the right foot, where there usually a space because the, stand, the statue was standing was the left foot. And then we we'll put that in view. Just to did a small comparison between the details of the toes and the nails in them and how crude these writings are, it's not going to need a professional to, to tell the difference between this and that. If they have this, why is it not done by the same fine details? And I know that this statue is not actually made by advanced machinery. The base of the statue is one of the places where they can add the writings. Next. Between the two legs, all the spaces that like you cannot miss in the statue. Next. On the chest. Next. On the belt. On the shoulders. On the braces. On the, sa on the other side of the statue. And in the back. Here, wait just a second. Here we can see something that that part, that line for Merim Bitah that's in the back is in a deeper level than the rest of the other writings, the rest of the back. You see, the line that has the writings is deeper 
that's probably because that's where the writings of the original owner or of the older writings were. <coughs> so so he, he doesn't want anybody to do what, the same like what he did to the statue. So for that, he will add the writings in everywhere. So if you're going to remove all the names and put new names, you're going to destroy how the statue looks like. And that goes, these crude writings can be found until the old kingdom time. This is part of the statue of Khafra, one of the statues that was found in the valley temple in Giza. Look how crude the writings are. And to compare that with this kind of anatomy and the fine details, like the ones in the knees, and look how crude that is. It's hardly done by pounding. Why we didn't use the same tools that we used to create the fine details in the statue to do the writing? That would be my question. Luxor Temple, this is an old picture to see how the temples looked like. And of course, as I said to some of my friends here, Luxor Temple is like a time machine. You can find all the layers of history laid above each other in it. Isis Temple. You recognize that lady? <laughs> Isis Temple, of course, is a Greco-Roman temple, according to the writings and the style of art and the type of stone that is used. Part of it, as we can see, was used as a church. You're going to see that probably within a couple of days. That altar, obviously, is not Coptic. It's one of the granite altars like the ones used to be in the Holy of Holies inside the temple. The symbolism of the Coptic cross was added to it in order to reuse it. The same case, but only in a different era. Now, can I use that symbolism to know the timeline of that device? No. Can I also use that symbolism to date it? No. Can I use the symbolism to relate it? No. To understand the function of it? No. This is so clear because it's done in the Coptic time, but we have many other examples that it was done during the dynastic time. So it's the same case. We cannot depend on symbolism to date and relate and understand the function. I would say 100%. We cannot be positive 100%. It shows also that adding the writings to granite stone or adding symbolism to granite stone is not impossible. Roman pillars were inside the temple when they recycled the Roman, uh, the Romans, when re they recycled the granite stone and built their structure from the same stone inside the same location. They were removed from there after that. This one also we have seen yesterday that two structures in Karnak are meeting. One is built on top of each other from the dynastic Egyptian time. Like this line has some characters that is going behind that gate that was built in modern time not modern times according to the, or comparing with the older one. Here we can see another one. We can see the figures of Horus. Also, and some of them is hidden behind that other wood. So, same like writings above writings, buildings above buildings. This is an obelisk, and that's the name of the obelisk. Tichin. That's the name of the obelisk in ancient Egyptian time. This obelisk, as you can see, it was used in a Coptic church as a pillar. So again, recycling the stone and reusing the stones more than once throughout the ages. Recognize that lady again? <laughs> a courtside shrine we found in old Cairo, in Coptic Cairo, and it has writings from the 30 dynasty. And we compared these writings with many of the other shrines, or naus, as they like to call them, in the Egyptian museum. And it's so clear that the naus itself, or that device itself, is much older than the writings on it. And then they made, like, carving so they can put the statue of Horus in the inside as an idol. Here it's the same case, but it's Jesus Christ inside. <laughs> Also, some of these nows, they used to make a, they dig a hole in it so the priest can emigrate sounds to the people when they come. 
the, in my opinion, these are power tools, power devices that they use, and then they convince the people that the power is coming from the idol in the inside, while it was coming from the device itself. <coughs> Go back, please. This is tennis. Everything here is a reconstruct. Officially, they say that the stones were taken from a city that was built by Ramses II, and the name of the city is called Per Ramses, means the house of Ramses. So some of the slabs, go next please. These are some of the slabs that was taken from Per Ramses to, re, to be reused in building the site again. We can see here writings upside down, and it's random of course, the space between the blocks is huge. You can fit your arm in between them, but this part here especially is very, like this token. This is good writings of Ramses. And we're going to see that when we go to tanks. But look, that square, that part of that square doesn't belong to these writings. This is from the older writings, probably Middle Kingdom. So even when we look at writings like that, that they look very good. They are in good precision, good carving and everything. There used to be another layer of of writings that was erased and so Per Ramses was not his because there are older writers who mm. next this is the pyramid of Titi in Saqqara we can see small stones but that doesn't mean that builders were primitive but the inheritors that renovated were Here is a statue from the Middle Kingdom time. Yet it has the name Titi related to that pyramid city in Saqqara from the 6th dynasty. So how come he lived in the 12th uh, dynasty? He lived in the Middle Kingdom and has the writings on his statue for Titi. We looked and we found out in the tag that it says that he ruled he was the official high, the chief of all the priests during the region of uh, what's his face? Amnimhat from the Middle Kingdom. So the Middle Kingdom inherited the pyramid cities with its priesthood and then <coughs> related themselves to it. So how can we be sure that the old kingdom didn't do the same thing? Abu Rawash is one of the sites that is not open for the visitors. And we read about it that it used to be a very popular site of, as a quarry for all the people loading not less than 100 camel loads every day from the site until the end of the 18th century. The positive thing was that, that it revealed how much work was done underground. So all this is cut in the bedrock itself very deep. So the pyramid structure will be actually starting from the core of the mound deep, and then they will build it up again. With the shape, of course, of the primordial mound in the outside. So they will create a route to the pyramid in the mound. This you can see a sense of scale. A war, a mud brick structure related according to the writings to the Middle Kingdom. And they say that they chose a cheap labor and a cheap material in the Middle Kingdom to save funds for it. That's why they used mud brick. And the pyramid itself used to have another structure front of it that was called the labyrinth. According to Herodotus the Greek, the labyrinth was 3,000 chambers. And according to Pliny, also the historian, the labyrinth had a huge sound resonance. And we read literally that just by opening a door inside the labyrinth, a sound like thunder will be generated. The Roman Empire felt so jealous from that structure because they actually thought it was made from a single solid piece. That's how perfect 
the stones were together. And we can see there quartzite and limestone and the granite stone <coughs> for the labyrinths. And for the pyramid itself, you can see that there used to be a casing stone from limestone on top of the surface of the mud brain. So in the end, you had a perfect limestone pyramid shape. And that's not all. We believe the mud brick was used for its quality, not because it's a cheap or a cheaper labor or that. Why do we think that? Because of the focal chamber inside that pyramid. This pyramid, this pyramid has what they, what's known as a, a unique and a complicated tunnel system, known for the academics to be made so they can mislead the Tomb Raiders. And they made a new design in that pyramid. Secret sliding doors in the ceiling. So there are three levels that you go down, and then first one you go down the same passage like we're gonna see in the Great Pyramid, like the one in the subterranean. But then it, it, it ends with a chamber that has no exit, and they found that the exit is actually a sliding door in the ceiling. And you do that twice until you reach the focal chamber. The focal chamber is housed in the bedrock, same like any other pyramid, and it also has a sliding door, but the material that they used for that focal chamber is one rare material, flips everything that is talking about cheaper labor or cheaper material. The focal chamber was made of yellow transparent quartzite. The focal chamber is made from a single solid piece that weighs around 110 tons. Single solid piece. And they use the three other pieces to the ceiling of it. One of them is the medium size. It's around 45 tons. That was used as a sliding door. And it was also made, all the ceiling is made from yellow transparent quartzite. So we only know that because the historians told us that. The pyramid itself, they dug that canal, you see that canal beside it? So they filled the pyramid in the inside. This canal is, is less than 100 years old. But it caused the pyramid to be full of water in the inside, and we cannot go to see that chamber. Only we depend on the documentation that happened by historians like Herodotus and Pliny. And also, Flanders Petri. Here is the water in the tunnel. Of course, it's not just water. There is also sand and mud. So where, where do we find that yellow transparent quartzite? It's very hard. Actually, I haven't seen any other example of it. And they didn't just bring some to use in the casing stone to make it look good. They put it in the core, functional and not decorational. This is what I like to call, again, the junkyard of Karnak. Look how much leftover granite from quarrying, from recycling. You have this amount of granite stone, so you can imagine Karnak temple that had lots and lots of structures, many structures built from megalithic pieces from granite stone. Also, the statue, the megalithic statues were recycled to make pillars out of it. This piece was in the Luxor Museum. It's that statue that they are hiding behind the, the curtain now. This is another piece. You can see these shattered pieces after they manufactured the, the <coughs> using the same technique like we, sh we showed front of the, of the middle pyramid, how they do the pits and then the scaffolds. That's always the technique of those who came to quarry the stone. That's another example also in Luxor Temple. Some of you have seen it, I think. And that's what we're going to see in Elephantine Island. The structure that they relate to the Greco-Roman era, they actually use the stones from the same island that was dated back, according to the writings of the New Kingdom. We were once there, and the, there is a 
there is a crazy archaeologist on that site. The site made him crazy. He, he chased people away when they go. He been there for more than 26 years. So that day we went and they were digging right front. You can see the dust. We literally saw like eight workers pushing a stone like this big. We went and did our tour and by the time we returned back, they were only like from there to here. But it was interesting because when we looked in the pit, we found more of the stones that they used from the older structure. And more. Quarrying during the dynastic Egyptian time. We have seen this, you and I, when we went to the Giza Plateau. This is a writing that was added on the middle pyramid complex during the region of Ramses II. And it's not done by Ramses, but it's by one of the priests. His name is Ma'i. Ma'i was the priest officially responsible about quarrying the stone from the Giza Plateau. And he proudly wrote it in the world. He didn't deny it. Also, the Middle Kingdom time used to be recycling stone from older structures in a wide scale. This is a piece looking like Osiris for the king, and it was brought from an area called Elisht. You can see the tag here, Sunusir, as an Osirian sheep, and the pyramid of Elisht that is related to the medical. In the official books, they say they found stones being recycled in these two pyramids. This is one of them. And this is another. These are the two pyramids in a list that they found that the stone on the casing of it had actually writings that dates back to the old kingdom. So they knew that they were recycled and they believed that it was recycled from the Giza Plateau. Then we cannot be sure. Maybe that this site enlisted, not maybe, I used to say maybe, but now I'm sure after I searched actually. This site is called Ethi Tawi, and in the official books, they, they label it as the capital of the Middle Kingdom. So nobody used it before the Middle Kingdom. But actually, there are all the Kingdom burials found there. So they might just have used the stones again to renovate a structure that already existed. Now we come to another thing. Based on my understanding that what happened in the Middle Kingdom from recycling the stone can be similar to what happened in the Old Kingdom, the official books mentions and documents until the Middle Kingdom that stones were being recycled from older structure. But was there another recycle in the old kingdom? Supposedly the old kingdom are the original builders. Here this is a base of a pillar from white calcite crystal in the Giza Plateau that was used by one of the priests. His name is Ra'wer. Ra'wer reused these bases of pillars as offering tables in his offering court inside his court. It's an evidence, so all that scene was added and it made the, the base of a pillar not perfectly round as it used to be. And it's an evidence that stones were actually being recycled from the old kingdom. And this is the end of the first dynasty. So the first dynasty, suppose where all the great pyramids were built. We have evidence here, conclusive evidence, that also in the first dynasty, stones were being recycled. The millstones, of course, we all have seen many examples of the millstones being made from the stone that they recycled. We have seen that one also in Dandara. This we're gonna see in Isis Temple. That's where the other millstone used to spin. Oil presser, this is from uh, Karanis. Karanis, by the way, is a city in Fayyum, and that city 
had many ovens to manufacture copper. Patricia actually had one coin from there. It's, it, they used to make money there. This is the, the earliest time for money. And it's not Egyptian, of course. Uh, the coins are not Egyptian. We had a kind of money, which is the rings from gold, or bronze, or silver, or electro. But that area was famous for making the currency. So we believe that's where the name currency came from, from the city of Karanis. Recycle, this also we have seen now, this is actually in Isna. That the stone can be transformed. We can look and understand that there was once one of the megalithic sites, even if the stones were reshaped into other things, like Coptic basilicas or Roman temples. Like that example, that's my brother Salah. Like that is example we have seen front of Abydos. You remember that example where the base of the pillar had some scenes? Thos and the king. Uh, the secret of ancient lost knowledge. <laughs> I did try just to see if it's gonna be working or not. <laughs> This, this piece, like people been demonstrating on it for the last 50 years, and all we got is some powder on the surface. <laughs> they believe, of course, that this pounding is what caused these amazing tool marks. The most amazing thing, in my opinion, about it, that it's continuous. And it's not just continuance. It's coming from like two and a half meter high and forming, each one forming like a step here. The same width, the same shape, as if something is being repeated exactly by the same tool. Not just that, it's also coming up again with the surface. So, upside down pounding. <laughs> you see that? <coughs> So the line is coming, forming, that these are the scoop marks. They're about this wide. So the pounder is only that wide. It's not going to create a pattern that's that. Of course, it's a ridiculous theory. But that's what they found there. I disagree with this because we always found the pounders where the other method of quarrying is. Like, we find all these founders on the Giza Plateau or in Abu Sirun, or any of the sites that was used as a quarry, only around the primitive style that they were using to recycle the stone, not to create this scoop marks. And that, you see all the scooping? There is a theory that it was, that the stone was being altered by fire. And of course, I don't believe that theory as well, but. Basically, they said they done it easily. The ancient Egyptian did it with ease because they built two walls of mud break and they filled in between them with wood or straw. And then they burned that and that caused the granite to be easy to be carved. That's, of course, nonsense. Show me. Anyway, that method of quarrying left these kind of surfaces. A straight surface. You see that also, we're going to talk about the ostrich when we go to Next. The test pits. They are so narrow that you don't have a space to swing your pounder. Plus, of course, you can see that shape itself is an extraordinary shape. And the patterns of the scoop in it looks horizontal not vertical as the other one. And here's another one. Some of them goes to 11 meter deep. And they are, next. They're that small, so there is no space for anybody to go inside and swing any hammer or anything. And this is granite stone. But the test pits were used to understand or to, to test the, the geological layers so they can follow the cracks, and they avoid it. 
because they wanted to extract pieces as big as possible. And the other technique also exists in the quarry. The pits, the scaffolds, the water, and then the stone is cracked. And this kind of technique lifts this kind of surface. This is the primitive style with the scaffolds, and it lifts that kind of surface. And that's another one. This was made by a very powerful chisel and a hammer. But the cut lines is not continuous. It's like that long. So I know where, how that happens. You, got, you carry the chisel and you carry the hammer and you start tuck, 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 tuck. That, 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 that's, that's how you get this kind of thing. That's how we can understand two of the three, the two primitive ones, we can understand exactly how they were done. Now we will talk about the official explanation about the granite stone in the old kingdom time, which they thought that the old kingdom era didn't have the capability of quarrying granite out of the bedrock. Then how was that done? That means the old kingdom, that means the pyramid builders. The pyramid builders, in the opinion of the mainstream Egyptologists, didn't have the capability to cut or to extract granite out of the bedrock. Where did they get that conclusion from? I believe they got the conclusion from studying the old kingdom too. But if you study the structure itself, perfection. No cracks, no extension. All the stones, are, all the pillars are on the same major. That reflects, of course, the capability of those who are manufacturing it. This here is a result of a chisel and a hammer. So we also want to know the capability of the dynastic Egyptians. We are not denying the capability of the dynastic Egyptians. But it's according to the academics, they didn't have the capability of extracting granite during the old kingdom time. That's supposed to be the era of the pyramid builders. But if you study the pyramid structures themselves, there is without a doubt a capability of everything, moving and the quarrying from not just one quarry. You see the patterns? This is handmade. by the copper chisels. This is handy me. As I showed some of you in the Egyptian Museum, the section of the Ostraka and the pieces that the trainers used to be practicing so they can develop the skill to do fine art and the fine work. You see that? That's best. This is a side view. This is a facing view and you can see that drawing and you can see then the three dimensions. These are not unfinished pieces. These were pieces made for trainers. Ostraka. It's that these pieces of stone that they found that they were practicing carving on it. <coughs> and of course carving first has to start with drawing. You need to be to draw very well first in order to be carved there. So when they are not, in the very early beginning, when they are not drawing well, then the teacher will come and correct. For example, in the beginning, he made the head so fat here in the back. <laughs> so he corrected, the teacher corrected it for him and sharpened a little bit the profile. The eye was lower, as you can see. Unfinished pieces from granite. Another one from granite. And another one from, this is actually a nice no, no, this is granite. This is also granite. This is a nice piece. It shows the different tools. How you get to that level. First you use a bigger tip, and then you use a sharper and a sharper and a sharper, <coughs> until you reach the fine details you are required. This is the method of the hand work, like that, and that. 
also. You see now, starting to take the anatomy shape with a finer tool. And now starting to create more details, also by pounding. And the more reaching now to a higher level, huh? Push up. And the more. The, the face view, of course, of the same piece. Hmm? You see, they're starting to create the eyes until they reach this level all by hand. This is just missing the final stage, which is polishing. So all that can be accomplished manually. Also, how they laid the glyphs and the scenes with such accurate precision, because it was a technical drawing. You can see here the black lines that's forming squares. <coughs> Sheets of wood were found with the scenes that they need to put on the wood. And as any type of technical drawing, if you want it to enlarge it, you enlarge the squares and then redraw according to the new scale. So you can enlarge it one to five, one to 10, depends on the size of the wall and of course the size of the sheet that you have. So the first, this is very technical. And we find that method from the early king of time. If we have the chance to go to the tomb of Petah Hotel, I recommend that we go visit it this time because it's, it's a really beautiful tomb. And that's how they laid all the writings on the boxes like that. It doesn't date the boxes, but that's how they laid the accurate writings. Coloring, even the symbolism, you can find, for example, the symbol help here, these two triangles above each other, is within two squares, exactly. And the read. Everything. That's why, that's the secret behind why all the glyphs are looking so mathematically figured out right. So it's not easy. Where is our friend that works with the <coughs> Right here. They also create the details with the drawing and then they carve it. And then they sharpen it again with colors and then they carve it again. It can happen three or four or five times until the director or the high priest that is running the work is satisfied. Also we can see the black color the black color around the symbolism that they used. Same like here. So it was not meant to be colored. It was meant to be carved on. The colors is just the preparation for carving. One of the most interesting scenes of the tomb of Rahmira, the vizier from the New Kingdom time. And this shows the labor of how they were making the mud break for the mud break rams for constructing, which is according to the officials, this was how, how it was done, how all the structures in Egypt was done. It would fit for some of the structures, some of the temples like Dandara, like Abydos, uh, even that we saw that they are magnificent and beautiful, but it's not gonna be how the pyramids were built, for sure. So what we can see here, these are people working the mud in a lake of water. This is water, as you can see, they're surrounded by trees to show that this is water and the waves. And then they, make it, they soften it, they use the axis to load it. And then this is the mold that they fill the mud in so they can create the brick. And then they will carry it after they do. This is another industry. We are focusing on that line down And then they will carry it after it's done. And, and they bring it. We are looking here at the, at the above scene. This is the ram road. You see that? All the parts that's brown and white and brown and white. This is all mud filling. But all the fine white stone 
this is the stone itself okay so in, uh, in order to create the pillars let's see say that we are bringing the first course of stones i will be building up the mud break ramp until that certain level i will drag the stones and then i will reach that height and then i will drag the stones to the next course and then i will fill the new space with mud break and have the ramp road be longer and then drag the next course of limestone or any other stone for the structure like the third course here myself for example and then fill in between again with the mud break and they bring the next course and fill that's that's the way we use mud break ramp as instead of the scaffold but it's not of course the technology of the pyramid builders. This is a tube drill cup from Abu Sir. We can see how fine the patterns are. And here too, actually Abu Sir has more evidence of ancient advanced technology than anywhere else. And this is why we know it was a tubular drill, of course, because the core that was taken out is still visible sometime, and of course the ones that was found by Flinders Petri. You see that core? Wow. Huh? That's what proves that the tool was hollow, was a tubular drill, not just a normal <coughs> drill. Here is one of the cores that was found by Flinders Petri in the Giza Plateau. And this also is from Abu Sir. This is a, a giant circular saw cut. And it's one of the, the best conclusive evidence. And I have many because we are not going to Abu Sir. So I, you can see all the patterns. It's not just, the circle is not just in the front. It's in all the other lines following each other. We have seen that in some of the tiles that's used in modern days, front of uh, Karna Temple, for example. But the width of the line there is, is much narrower. That shows that the disc was probably two and a half meter. Here, it's not less than eight meters, right, right? Yeah. You see the edge here, how it's turning? And here, that edge shows that that blade was not That that blade was not even one centimeter thick, it was around four millimeter maximum. You see the angle? Circling. And here too. This technology was never, that's why it's called the lost technology, this technology was never found only as tool marks on the stone. It was never found as a scene on the wall. It was never found as, as a tool, only as a result of the marks of the tools in the stone. The unfinished books, of course, we all have seen that. It's one of the conclusive evidence We can see here that the tool cut went not in the same order of that line, that it went a little bit off to the right. And that's probably what caused the damage to the lid. Also, the same power tools is shown. Which proves that it was made in China. <laughs> Next. Uh, and we have on the statues themselves some from the oldest eras like that statue that is related to Khafra. The same power tools marks between the legs on the thighs, a tubular trail between the feet. So we cannot separate 
the technology from the civilization. But we can only think that the old king at that time is the one that didn't have it, but olders did. That's why the same statues with the same figures is reflecting an ancient advanced ghost technology. Not this kind. This is the old kingdom scenes of carving the statue. We have seen this in the museum, and we will see more when we go to Sakkar. Polishing, again, this is where they got the polishing was, that was happening by a piece of rock and sand and water because of scenes like that. <coughs> manufacturing the vessels. When you search for manufacturing the vessels, you find this scene that shows all the different phases of manufacturing the vessels. From cutting the outlines, from emptying the core on the inside by a drill, and the polishing. So here is the drill, as it was explained on the scenes. A branch with two weights on both sides, and a shape like a fork that is holding a piece of flint. It looks functional, but was that how it was done? As you can see, they spin it like that. No, it wasn't. Here, some of the pieces, not just one, there is more than one, shows that the core was being emptied out using a tubular drill, not the branch with the horizontal piece of flint because the horizontal piece of flint, of course, will never give you this result. So there is a mystery. When you actually look for the scenes to prove, it proved the other way, proved that they didn't have the technology. So this one has the core inside it, and this one made from quartz also have the tubular drill core still visible inside. All this is from Flinders Petri Museum. And these are from the Egyptian Museum. Here, he, he, there is others from Prophyry and from granite and from basalt and from calcite. But he brought a saw, a copper saw, and then he put here quartz that is cut with a saw, and he th thinks that this was the saw. Of course, not, it's not. He made this mistake. It's okay, everybody makes mistakes. This is the saw that was used in woodwork, not in stone. There is no scenes. That is shown. The materials of these vessels and the timeline of it is another interesting thing that matches the pyramid mystery when it was built and everything. That's why researching the, the, the vessels is as good as also it reflects the same thing like if you want to research about the pyramid builders themselves. The hard and solid material like Cortezite and like granite. These ones in the back is slate. This is porphyry. Milky quartz. Diorite nice. Slate. Rock crystal quartz. Amethyst. Jasper, obsidian, and rock crystal, and it was found in the archaic age side by side with stone flints. These are from the prehistory time. The Jerzean civilization, which is one of the pre-dynastic civilizations. Those who found the, the burial zone, we will get to that. Okay, next. Another one from Persia, also from the pre-dynastic Egyptian time. Basalt stone from the pre-dynastic Egyptian time. Porophy, uh, granodiorite. And you can see this one that is made from pottery to look like it. And it is, the dots is to make it look like granite. These are also, we have seen, they are all from the pre-dynastic Egyptian time, 
and we can see also amethyst and marble and the diorite and slate side by side with pottery that was made by hand before they figure out the idea of the pottery wheel such as this kind of pottery you can recognize it it's brown underneath and then dark black and it's in a good shape but it's not perfectly symmetrical because it was done by hand pre-dynasty both found in the same burials this is some of the burials from the pre-dynastic wheat you can see here some made from stone and some made from mud break and these were found look at the burial is primitive to find in it something advanced like that and in the official books also they don't know how it was done, except that they think it was made with a happy heart. Whatever that means. The age of the site, between 12 and 14,000 years. Radiocarbon dating. And this is displayed in the Nubian Museum. So it's as official as it can be, the timeline. Hmm? See that? Between 14,500 and the 12, so it's not less than 12, and it's not more than 14 and a half thousand years. This is related to the 26th dynasty, around 500 BC, according to the writings. This is the same jar, and you can see that the light, the, the line of writing is not even centered in the middle of the face. And it's crude, very similar to the writings in the Sarapia. But that other one, uh, here you can see that, hardly scratches on the surface. So you can pass by that vessel and you wouldn't recognize that it has writing. Next. This other one we also have seen, the one that everyone thought it was a, a trash basket. <laughs> and uh, it has writings from the old kingdom, from the 5th dynasty time, as crude as the one from the 26th dynasty. Also the pyramid of winnings. The pillar itself is made from a single solid piece and the writing on it is like graffiti. The only scene of one of the phases of building a pyramid that is there is right here. It shows go next time. It shows here some of the pillars that is attached to slides and they are loaded on top of ships. You can see that high edge that that is prepared so when the load is heavy the ship doesn't sink and it has a line here that says Yuta Abu Ethip Math Wahu that means you see the two legs here returning from Elephantine do you see the elephant? <laughs> Abu is the Elephantine Island, where we're going to be going, inshallah, to see the Khunum Temple. Elephantine Island was thought of as the source of where the granite stone came from, from the ancient Egyptian. Returning from Elephantine, Ethip means loaded, and you can see the ideogram of it. There's a person carrying something in his head, that means loaded or be laden. Math, that's granite stone. Wahu is the plural for Waha or Wahi, that means pillar. Returning from Elephantine Island or from Elephantine, loaded with granite pillars. That's the only scene. Can we depend on it? If we can depend on it, then we can depend also on the same scene that shows how they manufactured the vessels. But when we studied the vessels themselves, of course we found that there is more than the technology being shown on the walls 
So there is a mystery. Sahura temple and which was inlaid with copper, that's where we find the green color. And it used to have a unique system which was labeled as a sewer system. The writings on the walls were written in a beautiful way, different than the other one. But we are not looking, we are not saying that all the writings on the walls is graffiti. But we cannot depend on it 100%. Next. Also one of the pieces that is left from a Cortezite megalithic colossal statue in Karnak Temple, that's a close by where we were. You see the scaffold? Yeah. No. Related to Aminhotep, according to the writings in it. <coughs> where is the doctor? Oh. What you call that part again? Huh? Epinikia. <laughs> when you look at the finishing of it and you compare it to the writings, they are different. Yes, this writing looks beautiful. But if you look closely, you will find that the courtside around the edges is smashed. That's because the tool is a fine tool, fine chisel, but it's different than here. It's so smooth, like as if it was softened and just, you know, like butter. Also, structures from stone that has writings from the archaic age. On the other hand, when they say the first structures started, the first structure from stone started in the third dynasty, and we are talking about the steep pyramid of Zosar, we're gonna be seeing when we go to Saqqara. They also have that actually wrong, because here we have part of a granite stone structure that's older than Zosar. All the scene on that side was defaced. Cylinder seals, and we talked about that a little bit when we were on the bus, that the cylinder seals were known from the earliest time that we found, from dynasty zero, actually. <coughs> cylinder seal is in the hand of the official, so they can roll it when they need to seal something it's part of the official system when they want to seal something and make sure that the person is responsible for storage doesn't take any of the goods in it. So those who make the inventory, after they finish the inventory, they roll the cylinder seal above a layer of, of brick, of uh, I mean, uh, mud, so they can make sure that nobody's gonna break these jars or containers that has the goods. So how long is the dynastic civilization itself? Of course, I showed the one from I showed the one from the burials in Toshka, the one that has the, the little bit elongated skulls with the vessels, and the, the timeline, which is 12 between 12 and 14 and a half thousand years, because the official, the other academic official timeline that is not depending on carbon dating, is talking about 7,000 years BC, 5,000 years BC maximum, not. Uh, 7,000 years is the pre-dynastic time and the dynastic time. But here we found these burials with the vessels in them from a very ancient time, not less than 12,000 years ago. Not less than 10,000 years BC. This is also an interesting piece. It's a tubular drill that was enlarged by another tubular drill, also Flanders Petri Museum. So that technology Definitely was in the hand of the pyramid builders, but it was not the hand in the hand of the dynastic Egyptians. Cuts and white calcite by the same technology. The bent pyramid, it's another mystic. Officially, they used to believe it's a mistake as if they're gonna bring the stones and the start, and then they found the angle is wrong, so they said, let's change the angle. 
every engineer that came to study that pyramid found out that it was needed or it was meant to look exactly like that. Every other engineer that came and wanted to prove that it's a mistake, after the research said it cannot be a mistake. So the officials started now to change their minds and say it's a, it's a pedestal with a pyramid on top of it. But then that leaves us in another mystery because they relate, well, they relate the bent pyramid, you can see the perfection here in the angle. They relate the bent pyramid and the red pyramid to Snefru and they say because the mistake that happened in the bent pyramid, they needed to build another one for King Snefru. So now if they are starting to change their mind that it's not a mistake, then why would Snefru build the two pyramids? This view is from my house. Wow. You are welcome anytime. Wow. Any questions? Wow. Yeah. The, uh, the core drills, yeah. the holes, have they ever found any with any apparent function? They seem to be very haphazard when we've seen them. Some of them had to be in the where the gates are put, like for the doors. But some of them are on the side. We don't understand the function of them. Yeah. We don't understand the function. We just need to understand the how it was done and who had the technology. Anybody has a question? Yes. Any question? Yeah. Have there been any examples of commission writing or are the commission objects completely devoid of symbols? I will only connect them if I found evidence that writings was done with power tools, and so far I didn't find it. Yeah. Um, how, with the regards to the bent pyramid, how come, what information did the engineers have to uh, come to the conclusion that it wasn't, a, that they weren't mistakes? That it wasn't a mistake? Yeah. Okay. One of the things they said, if, it, if they needed to change the, the angle, that means when they were starting to do that, walls started to collapse in the inside. So they changed the angle and then they formed the casing stone. So in order to, and this is the mistake of course, when you, when you already build the theory and then go to find the evidence. You need to research and then build up. The so building. there was no evidence of any collapse? They went and they did the, scanning for the inner stones so they said if we find the inner walls are cur curved deeply in the inside that means the theory is right so they scanned it and they found that the walls totally straight so thank you for listening thank you.